today we are really happy to have Ella LeBain with us here and I've been watching her for a couple of years since I met her and we're just really happy to finally have her here with us. So, a renowned biblical scholar, ET experiencer, and longtime UFO researcher and MUFON member, Ella is also the author of a highly popular original six book nonfiction series entitled Who's Who in the Cosmic Zoo A Guide to ETs, Aliens, Exoplanets, and Space Controversies. Ella's book series reveals in great detail the origins of the history behind and the upcoming disclosure of alien life and its historic effects on mankind's culture and world religions and is available for you today at the front lobby table. A native of New York City, Ella LeBain was educated in Israel. There she received a social sciences degree from the Biological Research Center of Negev in 1979, a department of Ben Gurion University. At that school, she was educated in biblical Hebrew and science. While in Israel, Ella learned to read and write Hebrew fluently and was educated in Hebrew linguistics. This information would later help her to delineate within her Who's Who book series the cast of characters in the Hebrew Bible and how those beings are relevant to today's situation and the end times prophecies. Returning to New York City, Ella then went on to receive an astronomy degree from the Hayden Planetarium in 1988, where she began her serious study of cosmology. Ella's close encounters with extraterrestrial beings, which began during her time in Israel in 1979, inspired her to dig deeper into what has become a 40-plus year journey to research and discover the truth about UFOs, aliens, ETs, gods, and angels. She has also extensively studied alien abductions and other paranormal activities and how all of these various concepts and ideas fit into the Bible's end time scenario. A Zechariah Sitchin protege, Ella interviewed the famed author in 1995 and then became a student in his international Bible study group. Ella was lucky enough to meet with him during his visits to Denver three times. Please help me welcome Ella LeBain. <laughs> so much for having me, Stacy and Shane. And um, in this season of gratitude, I'm grateful for all of you um, because this is my tribe. So um, I have a lot to get through here. So let's go through. Let's see. So what I always tell people um, before I start is to ask you for a temporary suspension of your unbelief. So I know everybody's a skeptic, and that's a good thing sometimes, but sometimes you need to kind of put that aside and let some new information in. So cognitive dissonance is a, is a major thing when new information comes in that's not what you were told or how you were uh, educated. And so um, disclaimer warning, there's going to be some stuff in this presentation that might uh, trigger that. Um, I'm not responsible for your triggers. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, it's okay. I'll be gentle. Um, so I, I love Mark Twain, uh, uh, his quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So how often do we hold closely to these uh, beliefs or um, patternings? And you know we're in the era of disclosure, and we, we have to be flexible to grasp new ideas and new concepts and new facts. So. 
A lot of it has to do with perception and perspectives. Um, so, you know, in psychology today, uh, they document this, and this is used by expert court witnesses when judging cases with multiple eyewitnesses. And you can have 12 people that can view the same event and have 12 different versions of the same story. So um, we wanna keep that in mind as we move forward with this material. Um, so I come from the legal field. I'm a retired paralegal. So uh, that's kind of how I've, um, I've used my skill set and applied it to this um, realm of trying to figure out um, what's going on, uh, as well as what was in the past. So history. And, and I'm a witness. Um, and so I see things through that lens. And you know, being in the legal field, there's a, a lot of pressure to be perfect and to prove things. And this is what I've uh, uh, set out to do with my book series, which is why the books are so big, um, because I'm proving stuff. And I tell people, well, if, if you want to use the books to help prove arguments and debates, go ahead. That's what I'm doing. Um, I connect dots. Uh, sometimes, you know, we collect a lot of dots and nobody really has any idea where they go. But, you know, just like that ch children's game, which was always fun to do, you don't really see the big picture until you connect all the dots. And a lot of times I'm like Peppy over here who's going all over the place and it looks a little chaotic, but we get there in the end. So thank you for being patient. So just caveat, I'm, I'm, I'm here to contribute. I'm not interested in competing with anyone. Um, I hope we all make it, and, and that's my heart uh, into this uh, presentation. So it's been quite a year, hasn't it? Uh, 2023, uh, we've had some major steps in disclosure, and um, a lot of us have been feeling vindicated, validated, confirmed, um, uh, because we've been told, you know, we're uh, imagining things and all the stuff that that uh, experiencers have had to endure. Um, but. Here's what we all have in common here, is that we're all truth seekers. MUFON, I'm so grateful for MUFON, for all the, the great work that, that you all do um, by bringing this to the surface, by bringing this to the consciousness, um, because everyone is seeking the truth. And we all go about it in different ways. Um, and I believe we're all branches of the same tree. And um, this has to do with tapping into the mind of God, uh, the super subconscious mind, it's also called, uh, or the morphogenetic field. So, you know, whichever language you want to use, it's, it's all part of the same thing. Um, Ancient Aliens did a, a documentary on this uh, in their early days about how people kind of pick, it's like picking a fruit off the tree and not everybody runs with it and does stuff with it, but some do. So that's what we all have in common here, so I just wanted to highlight that. So here we are in our era of uh, disclosure, and um, yeah, remember Bob Lazar? I remember what he went through, um, and major vindication this year. Um, so, you know, we have to um, count the blessings because we're moving forward on this. But wouldn't put it past this government that a cosmic Watergate has, what he has to say. been underway for the last, you know, 25 years. And at the same time, I don't think it's, uh, I think as we're growing up, or from the government's point of view, uh, I think we've, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've been adults uh, for hundreds of years, but from the government's point of view, uh, we're still growing up and eventually they might want to tell us something about what they've uh, discovered over, over, over the decades. So you, you've heard it from one of the uh, big directors who has been 
kind of on the inside of what's been going on uh, for a long time. And that's my uh, Monica, the truth is stranger than fiction. And sometimes uh, science fiction is used. Um, and this, this was something that was intentionally uh, put forth in the 1950s um, by the Majestic 12, where they knew that they had to prepare the public uh, and the public wasn't prepared to handle uh, the fact that we weren't alone and that there is an alien presence on Earth. And so they have been giving concepts to certain film uh, script uh, producers and, and writers. And um, Spielberg, I call him, was, uh, is one of them. And we can't forget uh, Close Encounters. That was based on a documentary. So it, it, we grow from there. So here's what I have to say about this year. Let's not put all our eggs in one basket because everybody is waiting with bated breath on the, the next shoe to drop in, um, in the government congressional hearings. And yes, there will be more. And I've heard that there's about 35 whistleblowers that are being vetted to come forward. So, um, you know, it's, it's unfolding. This is a dynamic situation. But um, I would like you to consider two other avenues of disclosure that um, maybe um, they're not looking at. And that would be Planet X. So, um, okay, so this photo over here in the bottom uh, left corner I took, um, I saw this with my own two eyes. Um, this is not a lens flare. It's not a camera anomaly. That's exactly what I saw, and that's what I shot. Um, and that was over my house in Westminster in January of 2020. Oh, and who knew that that was going to be the portents of what a year that was. Um, so I'm going to hopefully unpack this for you in the time we have here and connect the dots to what the ancient Sumerians told us about planet X, Nibiru as it's called, and um, we only call it Nibiru because of Zachariah Sitchin. That was his, uh, one of his translations, otherwise it's pretty much been called Planet X, but you know, X means a lot of things. X is the X factor, X is the num new Roman numeral 10. So, and each time the astronomers have been looking for Planet X for the past 130, 40 years, they are uh, looking for it by seeing perturbations on the other planets in our solar system. So it started with Saturn and then it went out you know, Jupiter and Neptune and Uranus and Pluto, and they continue to see perturbations in the orbits of Pluto, which is why they know that there's something else out there. And, and that's how everything got rediscovered, okay, because it's always been there, it's just been hidden from us. So, you know, um, and this was something that Zachariah Sitchin always emphasized about if you understand the past, you can predict the future. If you understand the past, you can be prepared for the future. And the past is prologue. And you know that saying, what goes around comes around? It's actually an astronomical term, because it has to do with orbits. So this is um, you know, something that I have uh, uncovered from all of this, and that is the duality and the battle between these gods over Earth, over us, and over the planets. Um, there's a whole thing about that even in the Bible, um, and we'll get more into that. So there's been an ancient battle between alien races for the control of Earth humans and Earth's resources. And this is uh, what we unpack. This one scripture that comes out of the Bible, Ephesians 6.12, my first book just Un, you know, unpacks and uncovers who these beings are. Uh, we war not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness of this present world, who are the archons, and spiritual wickedness in the heavens, who are aliens. So who are they? 
Um, if I can get to the end of the presentation, that's where I have all the hybrid stuff. So let's hope we get there. So, you know, this is another piece of discernment. Um, you know, there's an old saying, we teach what we need to learn. And that's something I had, that was my journey. Um, so, you know, and it's, it's helped me to develop a muscle that is that requires both the intellect and the intuition. So, you know, we're human beings, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, you know, it's like operating in two kind of dimensions, but we have to, in order to use your intellect, you have to have knowledge. In order to use your intuition, you know, you have to already have that knowledge so you know what you're sensing. And then there is a spiritual discernment, which is a spirit. It's, it's something that you can just pick up on a vibe, you know, something you're vibing out or you're, something is, uh, is a good vibe and listen to it. That's like your gut, that's your uh, brain in, in your gut kind of uh, thing. So um, this is something that, you know, has been my uh, journey is, you know, to try to unpack this because sometimes you have to be able to be multidimensional. I mean, it's not all about being street smart or book smart. You have to employ this spirit. And spirit is also part of science. So, um, and there's that old saying, the longest journey that you'll make in life is from your head to your heart. There's something to that. Um, not everyone that you see is who they claim to be, okay? And we have aliens living amongst us that look like us. They're human. So it's going to take a different kind of perception to see through that. Now, we, we have um, the, the Series V. Do you, does everybody remember the Series V from the 1980s? And, and that was deeply profound because we see that that is the truth stranger than fiction because there's a, there's a lot of truth in it. So um, I get caught in between this controversy of, you know, uh, between the New Age community and what I call the Christian fringe, um, because, you know, New Agers, they want to believe that the aliens are good. I mean, who doesn't, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that they're all good, okay, just because you want to believe that they are. And then, of course, Christians think they're all demonic, okay? So, so how can they both be right? Well, you know, the truth is often found in the middle ground. And, and this is where discernment comes in. Because just like human beings, earth humans, there's, there's good humans and there's evil humans. And uh, our history is, is, you know, rife with all of that. Why would we think that aliens or extraterrestrials are any different? So we have to employ discernment there. Um, so, and then, you know, there's another great debate, you know, did God create aliens? Well, the short answer is yes. Okay, it's, it's, it's in the Bible. Just because you can't see it there doesn't mean it isn't there. So here's my shtick on that, is that the English Bible has been heavily, grossly mistranslated. In fact, if any English person reads the Old Testament, you're going to get two words, Lord and God, and everyone will think that it's the same being. And I am saying it is not. Because when you, un when you unpack it in the original Hebrew, you, you see that it's actually a cast of characters that was completely covered up in the English translations. So unfortunately, that creates confusion, okay? And it also creates people turning off of God. They don't want, oh, God said this, and, and then he contradicts himself, and then he does that. Well, I don't want to have anything to do with that God. 
okay? And it turns people off of who God is. So there's a lot of things that have been lost in translations, and the cast of characters is, is one of them. So in, in my second book, I sort of unpack the cast of characters. I don't go over every word, I just go over the names and the titles, because there are names and there are titles, okay? And God and Lord are titles. They're not names, okay? So, you know, anybody, like president or king, anybody can be president, anybody can be king, anybody can be lord. I mean, in England, there's lots of lords, you know, lord of this and lord of that. So, um, you know, in order to discern who we're dealing with, we need to know their names and not just their titles. So in, in the 90s, I was teaching these classes in Florida, ETs, Aliens, or Angels, um, and, and trying to unpack all of this. And this is what I got. So my first book unpacks all of this. In fact, the whole book is about this chart, OK? And this is how I was shown how things are, which is a clash between two kingdoms. And you know, here in America, people don't think in terms of kingdoms anymore because you know we broke away from the British monarchy and you know we're Americans we're a republic we're a democracy yada yada okay but just because we don't think in those terms doesn't mean that that the the planet doesn't so you know uh, and and there's been kingdoms and kingdoms over and over again 400,000 years of them according to the Sumerians um, and everything is separated into these empires and kingdoms. So, you know, I have the human evidemic race, which is uh, what we're part of, um, you know, from Adam and Eve, the evidemic race, and the federation of human cultures. Yes, there are human extraterrestrials um, out there, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, we're not alone in the universe because it says so. It's not just, oh, well, it's a nice thought to have. I prove that it actually says so and for people who really need to see that in writing in the Bible. So it is there. Um, and then we have the reptilian empire, which I call the draconians, the drakes, the dracos, and also Satan. So Satan is a Hebrew word which means adversary or rebel. So Satan is not a, necessarily a name. There is many Satans, and I, that's why I pluralize it in my books, because it's a grouping. And then you have the alliance, the confederation, the moderates, which is the same in almost every battle or war. There's always people that are wanting to play both sides or become peacemakers or become spies or try to fuse the two, okay? So this is another aspect of this battle. So, you know, um, we have so many things from the past that is literally written and etched in stone that we can draw upon. And uh, this is one of them, this battle between reptilian entities. So this is just to show you that, you know, why, why do we separate things in kingdoms? Because it's been done for hundreds of thousands of years, okay? And these are like the four main that we have right now. You know, so I'm going to go over Sumerian, but the Vedic, the Mayan, the Hopi, which is here present day. And um, the Hopi prophecies also uh, point to Nibiru. Um, and Sitchin wrote about this uh, in, in this book, There Were Giants Upon the Earth, which I'm going to get into. So let's go straight to this. This is, you know, the signs in the heavens and what we're seeing in the space telescopes, the SOHO, the LASCO coronagraph, the Helio viewer, the GOES, the A1A. There's, there's a plethora of, of tech up there that is focused on the sun. Okay, so it's public. So you can go to NASA's uh, website and look at it. I, I do, myself and other researchers are looking at it daily. You can screenshot, you can video. This is, this is not secret. However, they do from time to time black things out, okay, because they're covering stuff up. So 
just to kind of unpack, the planet X is a system. It's not just one planet. So this has to do with, um, you know, news flash. We are not, uh, in, our sun is not singular. We're binary, okay? So this is something most of us didn't learn in school, but we are in a binary system. And most stars in the galaxy and the universe are binary. It is a common uh, thing, or trinary even. But ours is binary, and we have a brown dwarf that orbits and dances around our sun, and it's, it's cyclical, and it, and it has its own, it's its solar system, and it has seven planets. And Nibiru, AKA Planet X, um, is part of that. So Nemesis emerges behind our sun, and that's why, you know, for years we didn't know about it because we didn't see it. But then once it comes around, we start to see it, and I'm going to show you pictures of, you know, how it's looking. Um, so because the, the black is a, we call it a black star because it doesn't radiate light anymore, but when our sun illuminates it, it looks like a second sun. Just like when our sun illuminates the planet Venus, it's like a big bright star. And, and I'm sure all of you know that Venus is probably mistaken to be a UFO, is one of the biggest things, you know, people look at it and it's like it's glowing and it's, well, the sun is doing that. And the sun, when the sun hits ne uh, nemesis, it looks like another sun. So we have these uh, seven planets around it um, that uh, were recently renamed. So I've incorporated the Hopi because the Hopi prophecy has to do with the blue and the red kachina. And the Hopi said, when you see the blue kachina, know that the red kachina is going to follow. And the red kachina um, is their term for Nibiru. Okay, or one of, one of the Nibiru, Nemesis Nibiru system. So in 2017, we had one of the biggest disclosures. The 2017 was a big year for disclosure. So we had the seven Earth-sized planets that were uh, discovered around a brown dwarf star. Um, and they named it TRAPPIST-1 after their telescope in Chile. Okay, so, so we have many names for the same system. And this is also something to discern when you're looking at it, because the Chinese, they called it the Red Dragon, the, the Greeks called it Herkobolis, um, the, the, the Jews call it the Messianic Red Star, uh, the Sumerians called it Nibiru, uh, and now they're, they're calling one of the planets in the Kepler-90 system Tatooine. So, you know, is the truth stranger than fiction? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, you know, I'll let you guys decide. But um, the writing, and this is important, you know, as a premise, is that the, uh, the language, how the language evolved. Now, one of the things that Sitchin was known for was the fact that he was fluent in five different languages. And so this is something that I learned from him that, you know, the ancient Sumerian cuneiform evolved into Aramaic, which is ancient Hebrew. So the first Old Testament was written in Aramaic, ancient Hebrew, which doesn't have any vowels, no dots or dashes. And it wasn't only until uh, the seventh century where the Masoretic Jews rewrote the Old Testament and put the vowels in. So this is where we get the word alphabet from. It comes from Hebrew because the first two letters were alpha and bet, still are. So here's something we, we are seeing um, is this uh, gigantic uh, spherical object that has showed up around our sun multiple times and sometimes in pairs. So um, we don't know what it is, but right there in the middle, I mean, this all comes from NASA's technology. I just added Star Wars uh, just to, to prove, you know, is the truth stranger than fiction, because it, it looks like the Death Star. 
And yes, Tatooine is real. As I said, they use that name to name other planets because it has to do with the binary. So was Star Wars preparing us for this binary system? And all these three are from the Star Wars franchise. The one in the middle there is an actual photo that was taken uh, in 2020. So 2020 was a year that, that somehow Nemesis came around the sun and we were seeing two suns. I also took photos, not the one that I showed you, but I have others uh, setting over the mountains where there's like two sunsets because I live in, uh, in Colorado and the sun sets over the mountains and there were like two suns setting over the mountains. So here we go. So this is the stuff that I was priming you for. Um, so Nibiru is like the pink elephant in the living room. Nobody wants to talk about it, and why? So these three, we're going to get a little political here, so I hope I don't trigger you guys, but um, this, is, this is history now. So these three presidents have something in common. So in the early 1980s, NASA revealed evidence through Iris, which is that photo up at the top uh, right corner, was the uh, NASA's interface region imaging spectrograph they sent all the way out to the edge of the solar system, and they photographed Nibiru. Nibiru has wings, and those wings are like comet tails. So. Um, Ferrada, um, Carlos Muñez Ferrada, who was a Chilean astronomer from the 1940s, very, very accurate in all of his predictions about it. He called it the comet planet because it is a planet, but it also has um, comet uh, characteristics because it has these tails and it looks like wings. And this has always been depicted with wings, even in the ancients. So President Reagan uh, saw that. And meanwhile, he's uh, in the process of national security and creating the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which he dubbed the Star Wars system. That was his words. And then later it became known as Solar Warden, the secret space program. But here's what he did, okay? So when he, uh, Reagan and Thatcher and Gorbachev, remember that trio? They got together and they discussed all this and they saw that something was coming and they had to either, they had to cover things up and they had to prepare. So he wrote into this executive order that no one was allowed to talk about it, to write about it, and that the word was supposed to be like deleted from dictionaries and everywhere. Now, meanwhile, this is the 80s. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin's books began coming out in the 60s and the 70s. He has 12 books. So this is when things started to get a little heated. Up in, and I prove this in my fifth book, The Heavens, which is all about Nibiru, the history here, that the astronomy magazines have been talking about it and searching for it since the 1930s. And, and they continued articles about it. Up until this time, there was a blackout. Okay, so he uh, basically put this in with this executive order that had to do with national security because it had to do with weapons in space. And it was top secret. So what happens with these executive orders is that when the next president comes along, a lot of them just roll it over. You know, They don't necessarily gut it or change it. And, and that happened all the way through uh, uh, the Obama era. But here's what happened. When uh, uh, Donald Trump got into office on day one, the first thing he did was gut Obamacare. And somehow, Obama incorporated these executive orders that for national security were somehow written into the Obamacare bill. You know how they do that? You know how like they do these big bills and then they slip things in and nobody really knows what it is? Remember that famous uh, saying that Nancy Pelosi says, we have to pass the bill in order for you to know what's in it? So there's a lot of those types of shenanigans that go on. And when Trump did that, it sort of released this uh, gag order, if you would, on Nibiru. So now we're talking about it again. So 
you know, UFO disclosure and Nibiru is, to me, intricately tied and connected. I, I really don't think we can, uh, you know, as a community of ufologists, look at the UFO phenomenon and not look at this, because we're not alone here. And this system, uh, the Nemesis Nibiru system, is intersecting and interloping in our solar system, in our solar neighborhood. And that's not just about planets and moons and comets and asteroids and meteorites and fireballs and all the space junk. It also has to do with spaceships. So we are seeing all kinds of anomalies in the uh, the Helio Viewer, the Cactus, the GOES, the Lasco Crew, and the Space Telescopes. And we're, we see, sometimes we see two, sometimes we see moons that show up because they're orbiting. And we also see spacecraft, okay? Because these are, you know, obviously some type of intelligence. And for it to show up that big, it's huge. I'm gonna show you, uh, um, um, you know, to compare like Venus, when Venus goes over the sun, to these. I mean, Venus is like a little black dot, okay? This is like, like Jupiter-type planets, huge. And this is just to show you all the tech we have up there that focuses on our sun. Okay, for all kinds of reasons. Obviously, you know, climate change. And this is where the whole global warming stuff got birthed out of because this system is perturbing our sun. So our sun is having plasma exchanges with this system. And it's causing our sun to belch coronal mass ejections more frequently, solar flares more frequently and more intensely that I'm gonna show you how they're changing not only Earth but the whole solar system. So, you know, here's a, a scripture, uh, Luke, in, in the Bible that talks about men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, because the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Well, you know, in Hebrew, the word heaven is shamayim, which is the same word they use for skies. Okay, skies, heaven, same thing. Okay, so when people look up at the sky, they're gonna see all this stuff that they're gonna be like, whoa, what is that? It's scary. Besides gigantic spaceships, like what happened here in you know, Phoenix with the Phoenix lights, that's, it's awesome, it's scary. But besides spaceships, there's other planets that are coming and getting close to us. So I wanna just caveat by saying, Nibiru is not going to hit the Earth, okay? But one of its asteroids is supposed to, okay? And that's why NASA has put all their energy in, into the DART program, okay? Which, you know, was depicted in the movie Armageddon, if you guys remember that, with Bruce Willis and how they went after uh, the asteroid uh, to stop it from uh, hitting the Earth. And they blew it up and it was like a suicide mission for him. But they're not doing that. They're not doing suicide missions. They're using technology to nudge them out of their orbits so that they don't uh, come to the Earth. And they know what's coming. So, you know, our planet has shifted, okay? Each time we have these intense earthquakes, like nines, it, it, it does cause the planet to shift off the axis a little bit, which changes time. It changes how we uh, um, experience time, how we tell time, and lately, doesn't it feel like time is speeding up? because they've actually shaved like 20 seconds off of our day. And we, our calendar is, has apps, the Gregorian calendar that everybody goes by, like today is November 18th of 2023, that's Gregorian. It has absolutely no astronomical sense or, or uh, um, it's, it's not even relevant to the, the real astronomy, which is why they have to catch up with leap year, which is coming in uh, February 29th of 24. So this is something they've been preparing since World War II. 
Okay, so World War II, all, anyone who studies history knows that the world wars are connected. World War I was connected with World War II, and World War II is a, you know, World War III is a continuation of World War II. And what happened in World War II? Well, you know, there was, that's what the Cold War was about, was the alien tech that the Nazis had. So I have a chapter, um, a very big fat chapter in my fourth book about alien technology that, that was given to Hitler by the reptilians, okay? So I kind of encourage people to look at that because that's history. Um, so, you know, that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen again. And this is just uh, a little background on me. Um, I, I know Stacy told you that I uh, was educated in Israel. That's where I went to school in Sedebo Care, which um, was like a little mini Grand Canyon, um, very beautiful, just like Arizona. And um, that's my degree in Hebrew. And I left. Um, I graduated in '79, then went back again, and I haven't been back since '83. Israel has changed tremendously. But here's a whistleblower, and I am so grateful for the whistleblowers, okay, because what courage it takes and bravery to come forward, uh, it's not easy, but it seems to be a pattern with octogenarians. So when they get to be like 88, 85, in their 80s, they're like, you know, it's time to spill the beans because I could die tomorrow, and I, don't, I, I need to let people know what's going on. Well. I, I would like to encourage all of you to keep an eye on this whistleblower, okay? And he is the former Israeli space security chief, Chaim Eshed. Um, and uh, does everybody remember what he said in 2020? 2020 was a blur to a lot of people because of the pandemic, and there this came out, and it was like, oh, okay. And the thing that was interesting about what he said was not just that the, there is a galactic federation. My first book is all about the federation. And like one of my negative comments that was made, you know, was like, oh, oh, like it's like I'm doing Star Trek or something like that. Well, that's where the truth is stranger than fiction because, you know, why did they put that into Star Trek? Because they were getting people prepared to accept the reality of a federation. Okay, and in, in the 1990s, um, I, uh, was, I befriended and met uh, the, uh, Donald, uh, Colonel Donald Ware um, from Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and uh, he became a whistleblower. And one of the things that he told me that I never forgot was they were going to transform the United Nations. And the United Nations in the future was going to get transformed into the United Federation of Planets, which is very similar to Star Trek. So I put that in my book, and everybody went, oh, I'm just you know, fantasizing about Star Trek. But then Chaim Eshed comes out and says, the Galactic Federation is, is working in agreement with Israel and the United States of America, and President Trump knows about it. OK, so wasn't that like a bombshell? And, but here's the thing. His book, OK, so he came out in this, um, the Yedidot Achronot, which is like the equivalent to the New York Times here. And then they put everything, in, and they, uh, put everything into his book, the whole, uh, the whole nine yards. But you can't get his book in any other language but Hebrew. Um, it, you can't even download it. I mean, if, if, if there was a download, you can put it through a translator. So I'm, I'm getting his book, and that's my goal of 2024, is to translate it and then come back and you know, tell the community what he has to say. They have covered this up. Okay, they didn't want, he's still alive. They didn't want him talking about it, obviously. Um, but this is something to keep an eye on, okay? And, uh, you know, not only did he say that aliens are real and they're avoiding humans because we're not ready, um, and Trump was on the verge of revealing this, okay? Um, you know, let's not forget he did Space Force. Why? Um, so they don't, you know, they don't want to start mass hysteria. They want, they want us to be prepared for this. They've been waiting for humanity to evolve, to get to a level where they can reveal themselves. 
So here I'm going to spill some tea with you all. Um, so this just happened, OK, recently. Um, so I, my friend Rich Sheck, he were, uh, writes for Exo News. He just shared this with me, that Robert Bigelow has now put all of his uh, eggs in one basket towards Trump now because of this. OK, so that's one of the reasons, and there's many reasons, but that's one of the reasons why they attack him so much, because he knows. OK, and, and there's UFO files, and he has, and this is relevant, OK? And it's just a matter of time until this comes out. Um, also, a little uh, history, Bill Burns uh, wrote in his uh, 2015 uh, book, UFO Hunters, his second uh, volume two, that it was Israel's decision to expose the US cover-up of the UFO phenomena, but they were uh, advised against it. So this is what I mean about let's not put all our eggs in one basket because something is coming and maybe not in the way that you expect it. So why do you think the Federation thinks humans aren't ready for contact? Well, has anybody seen what happened on October 7th uh, in Israel? Uh, the, the, the level of cruelty that went on there? I mean, it's not just war. It's, it's torture and, and horrible, inhumane things that, that were done. And there's a level, there's humans on this planet that, well, they don't represent me. They don't represent you. So, you know, it's like the movie Contact. Like, who represents planet Earth? And who will the, the Federation talk to? It's certainly not going to be Hamas, OK? So um, the racism on this planet is pretty much off the charts again. And um, you know this is all connected to world, the World War II, and how they want to undo what they did uh, in the United Nations Charter in November of 1947 to make the decision to create uh, the Jewish State of Israel. So. Here I have a little bit of, you know, showing you from the past um, that these, you know, the symbolism of the gods from Nibiru um, are in uh, Christianity as well. And the Colburn Bible, the Colburn Bible talks all about Nibiru. And that was obviously in Egypt. Um, so that's a, a, a resource I recommend for people to, to look at. Um, so I'm going to go through the, some of these pictures so we can get through this part. Um, so we're seeing these uh, big spherical objects around the sun often. Um, and they eclipse the sun. Okay, so this is another piece of this whole puzzle is that they're, they're, they're eclipse, this one planet goes every 28 days, like clockwork. So I'm going to show you um, a little later in the slideshow that they have technology to cover that up because they don't want people to think something is wrong. Like all of a sudden at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it goes, the light changes. It doesn't go dark. It just goes a different shade of light, like bright white light. And that has to do with the solar simulator that they put in place with all these mirrors and prisms and to obfuscate the light so that when this planet eclipses the sun, we don't see it. But there it is, OK? It's in the space telescopes. You can't make this stuff up, OK? And the rest uh, are photos from around the planet of the two suns and some dark stuff that, that is showing up. And the red, we, we call it big red. That's not necessarily Nibiru. It's one of the other planets in the system. Because remember, Nibiru has the wings. And Nibiru isn't here yet, but it's on its way. We, we also see, like, like this is like four times the size of Earth, this little thing. It's not as big as the other one, but it's a, you know there's, there's moons that show up, and of course so um, the Anunnaki. So the word Anunnaki uh, from Sitchin has to do with 
from the heavens to the earth they came. Let's just call them extraterrestrials, okay? They came out of the sky, they landed on earth, ETs. And they're in, written in stone all over the place, okay? But, you know, look at the size of the beings con compared. You're seeing they're giants, okay, compared to the earth humans. So let's unpack this. Who are these gods, alien gods? Well, um, one of the things I got learned from Sitchin was, again, the language that the word Elohim in Hebrew is plural. Now, Hebrew is a language of physics. 22 letters, each letter represents the 22 major constellations. And you, it, it, things in, in Hebrew, it's like a tree. The, the root of the tree and all the words come off of that. So it's either singular, plural, masculine, or feminine. There's no in between. So the word Elohim is plural, okay, for gods with an S. And this is where, you know, the whole cast of characters is in my second book, Who is God? And, um, you know, there's smear campaigns all throughout history against some of these gods because there's been battles. So it's hard for people to know, well, who's the good one? Who's the evil one? But we can unpack that because we can see by their fruits we know who they are. And also through language, okay? So for instance, Enlil. So I traced linguistically that Enlil became Allah. Now, first of all, let me just caveat that Enlil and Enkai, the two brothers from uh, the Anunnaki that fought over Earth, that fought over Earth humans, these are titles, not names. Enlil, En means Lord. So Enlil has to do with the Lord of the air. Enkai has to do with the Lord of the water. Okay, so there's been multiple lords after them that have fit their shoes. It's kind of like a pharaoh, many pharaohs, many kings. So the ancient prophecies, they point to their return to harvest the earth and to resolve this final conflict between them and the creator god. Now in the Sumerian, the creator god was the father Anu. So Anu was the father of 50 great gods. So he is known as the sky god of the heavens. So in Hebrew, that is the Sva um, uh, Shemaim, the um, Adonai Tsebaot, which is the Lord of Celestial Armies, or the Lord of the Skies, or the God of the Skies. And he's the top God. He is the Father. So in, in Hebrew, he is known as Yahuwah, but he has like about 35 different names that I've unpacked in my second book, Who is God? So he's known as the Almighty. So he's the one who has the power to punish the lower gods. And the Passover story uh, in the book of Exodus was, by the way, the last time Nibiru passed the planet, which was we're due. That was, uh, so Sitchin said that it can, comes, they come around every 3,600 years, but that's lunar years, because that's how they counted in the past, which is equivalent to 3,567 Earth years. So we're, we're very close to this return. So if you see uh, the, the story in Exodus, this father god punished the lower gods, and they punished the gods of Egypt. Okay, so this is all part of the same story. So the, the god of Israel, okay, is also part of this whole uh, cosmic drama over this piece of land. Okay, and I'm going to show you that who owns that land is this God. Okay, and that the whole, I'm going to, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but okay. So, so this is all about the names. So you have the yud he uh which literally translates to I am that I am. Okay, and a lot of people mispronounce 
uh, that name and call it Yahweh or Jehovah, no such thing in Hebrew. Okay, Yahweh is German, Jehovah doesn't even have any Hebrew relevance, there's no J in the Hebrew language. So his name is pronounced Yahuwah. And I traced in my fourth book, Covenants, which is where the ancient Israelites ended up, the, tr the lost tribes of Israel, and how they ended up in the diaspora all around the world. And they came here to America, and one of the Native American tribes continued calling the great spirit Yahuwah. Okay, the, the Cherokee tribe continued that tradition orally. So I, I show you that, it's all proved um, historically. So we know that, that, you know, and then Yeshua comes out of Yahuwah. So the, the name of the Father is manifested in the Son. So I also put together in my third book, Who Are the Angels, all these scriptures that were in the books of Enoch. Now, I know you guys can probably handle this. Christians will go, ah, that can't be. But um, a lot of people believe that Enoch, who was a frequent flyer, by the way, he didn't die. Enoch came, came up, he came up, he came down, he was sent back and forth a few times, as well as Elijah. They didn't die, they ascended into uh, Merkabah's spaceships. And Enoch was uh, in, in, uh, tasked uh, to write 66 books. We only have three today. And his words told the whole story of this cosmic drama with these fallen uh, sons of heaven, the B'nai Ha'Elohim, which are the sons of the gods, plural. And so in my third book, Who Are the Angels, I basically took the scriptures that come out of Enoch, <clears throat> excuse me, and matched them up with the words of Christ and some of his disciples. They were quoting him directly. I proved that. Also, Enoch and the book of Revelation, it's, they're oddly connected. So, you know, we've been led to believe that these gods from the ancient civilizations were just myth. You know, I mean, we have Greek mythology, but these, this is all part of the same story of when the Anunnaki came to Earth and they used, you know, they, there was a rape that went on. Okay, I'm gonna say that. It was a rape. They raped the Earth women and they created Nephilim. So the word Nephilim in Hebrew means fallen ones or rejects or miscreants. It's a word that can be used in all of those texts. And this is why there's similar stories in all of these religions. So here's the list of the of 12 of the uh, end time prophecies that are already happening as we speak. Number 12 hasn't happened yet. But that's another avenue of disclosure. So I happen to believe that the alien presence lives with us here on Earth. That's not to say that they're not on other planets or other star systems. And as I've already said, the Nemesis Nibiru system isn't just a bunch of space rock. They have spaceships and there's beings and there's a whole thing going on there. So, you know, we're getting it from we're getting it from two different sources. I'll give you just a couple of minutes to just read that. So this is, what I have here is a, an illustration, obviously, of what is described in Revelation that is going to come out from inside the earth in during the tribulation times, okay? The seven year tribulation that has been predicted both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's called the times of Jacob's troubles. And Jacob, as you know, became Israel. So it's all focused on Israel. So 
you know, as you know, Sitchin was Jewish, and you know, he knew Hebrew really well, and so he was able to decipher a lot of this, and um, he was my inspiration, so I honor him here, and um, you know, he's, he, he, he said one of the things that um, he was always asked in all of his lectures, when? When will Nibiru pass the Earth? And he was always very tight-lipped about it. And for good reason, because after the 1980 um, cover-up, there was a, a, a meeting between him and um, Robert S. Harrington in the 90s, early 90s, and he was the chief NASA astronomer, and the two of them got together and they corroborated. So Sitchin is coming from the past, and Harrington is coming from the space telescopes, and they both corroborated corroborated the path that Nibiru was coming in, <clears throat> which was from the southwest. And the only discrepancy was, you know, it was either Virgo or Libra, which is very close to each other in terms of stars and the, the area the, um, of, the, of the Milky Way that it was going to come through, but it's coming in from the southwest. So after that, um, Harrington, 50 years old, comes down, and they, want, they published their interview, and he comes down with this rare form of esophageal cancer and dies, just like that, perfectly healthy. And Sitchin was threatened and told, if you ever tell anyone in your lectures when, we're going to shut you down. <clears throat> so he didn't. But he always said, it's not coming in my lifetime. And he was right, because he left us in 2010. <clears throat> so I'm just going to go through some of these pictures um, before we go to our break. I have some illustrations with pictures together, so I'll just let you look at them. Those are photos that were taken by a, an Earth telescope, obviously the one, uh, anything you see with the, the, the sun is always blacked out in the Soho so that they can see what's around the sun. So this is also, um, you know, the, it, it's the messianic prophecies is all about this messianic red star that is prophesied in the Torah and the Zohar as the sign in the heavens that the Messiah is coming. So this is, these beliefs are held very dearly in Judaism, Christianity, even Islam. Okay, because Islam came out of Judaism and, and Christianity. And NASA has known about it for, for decades now. So um, what I'm showing here is that there was a time where it was the only place on Google Sky it was blacked out. So I have the coordinates. They're, they're written there if anyone wants to take it down. But these are all, this is Google Sky. These are telescopes. This is a, a photo from the ISS of a big red planet on top of the Earth. And the ancient prophecies tell us that, um, you know, this is kind of what I've already told you about the different names for it, but they, they're all, it's a confluence of the same prophecy. It's all coming together. So we have seen the blue Kachina, according to the Hopi prophecy, because they have renamed that planet nine. And that's sort of the blue-black planet that has to be seen in infrared, which is hanging out at the outer edges of our solar system. The Revelation prophecy talks about wormwood. I'm going to get into that in, after the break. And that wormwood is a, an asteroid that comes out of this system. It's not Nibiru. And it destroys one third of the Earth's waters. And, but you know, the good news is, is that after all this change happens, and the, the poles are going to shift, and everything is going to change, it, we enter into a new age, and heaven comes to Earth. So, we have hope. 
So this is also about the sixth seal, Revelation 6, 12, and Joel 2, 31. So, you know, for years, Christians got really confused about this, and they thought it was lunar eclipses. FYI, lunar eclipses happen like clockwork every six months. And at least once a year, we have a total, which is the blood moon, okay? It's impossible to have a blood moon eclipse and an eclipse of the sun at the same time because a blood moon eclipse is a full moon and, and the moon can't be eclipsing the sun if it's full. So what this scripture is referring to is the red iron oxide that is going to come into our space. Actually, we move into its space. Earth is orbiting, and we're going to meet up with the tail of Nibiru, which is full of red iron oxide. And that's going to cause our sun to go black and our moon to go red at the same time. So it's going to be a massive meteor shower, OK? And the atmosphere in the sky is all going to change. But it's, it's not going to last. It's, it's a passing. So what we have is a, a combination of exoplanets, solar cores coming from inside this uh, solar system, as, as well as spaceships. Um, and we're seeing a clash of two solar systems, literally, okay, in each other's space. And this is, I write about this, this is why I believe that um, the promises of God in the book of Isaiah and the book of Revelation talks about, I am going, the Lord says, I am going to create a new heaven and a new earth. The old earth will just pass away and you'll remember it no more and you'll have the new heaven and the new earth. Well, you, you, when you read that and you go, well, what's wrong with the old earth? This. Okay, the fact that this, this is, uh, Manuel Velikovsky, friends with Albert Einstein, wrote in the 1950s, Worlds in Collision. And he basically, through physics, proved that the um, asteroid belt was a broken up planet. And how did that planet get broken, which we also call Maldek, and in the Bible it's called Rahab? How did it get broken up? Because this system came in and it collides. So the moons collide with planets and they create these big explosions and it, it's just too close. So I think the dynamics, the celestial dynamics here have been off. But the Lord has kept it because he uses it to uh, recreate the earth. Okay, to change ages and eras. And we are coming up to the end of the age of Pisces, which is the processional age. So I'm going to get into that after the break. I'll just show you some pictures and we can go. These are all photos. This is a, a, just an illustration, but all of these are photos on the bottom. So we're seeing, you know, moons. There's little moons around these planets, too. That's uh, Revelation 8, 11, and 13 about Wormwood, which is an asteroid. These are just um, some uh, articles to prove that you know this has been talked about in the magazines for the longest time. So as you can see, that is a, a, how the binary system sort of intersects. And this is the end game. And I don't mean the Avengers, but the final galactic drama that's being played out over the Earth, over us, in the end times, which we're in, and the very last days of the end times of this processional age of Pisces. So it's the final cosmic drama between these ancient alien gods and the lord of the cosmos, the final clash of the titans, if you will, a divine appointment for who gets to rule the Earth in this solar system. So this is what I was saying, how they get into each other's orbits and space. So I'm just going to go through these a little quickly. Um, this is just to prove that this was all happening in the past. It's written there. And one of the things, let me see, oh yeah, here we go. So this is one of the controversies that Sitchin always faced. Everybody said, that's not, a, 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 that's the Pleiades. It's not the Pleiades. The Pleiades, 
uh, are hundreds of stars, not s seven sisters because they're the bright ones, but they're hundreds of stars. These, this repetitive piece in, in these bas reliefs and in, in the uh, tablets and written in stone in Persia, Egypt, ancient Samaria, they're all showing seven between the sun and the moon. That's not the Pleiades, that's another solar system that is with us. This was the, the cylinder seal, and these are all uh, in the um, London Museum. You know, more of these. Th and, and down there is an actual photo from a telescope from Earth, and then the rest are the, the cactus and the Lasco and then the, the ancient walls. Ah, so here's another piece, Vulcan, Star Trek. Spock, it's real. Vulcan is a real planet. Now, I was told this in the, in the 1990s that they're gonna discover more planets by an astrologer, Vulcan, and here it is. Not only did Sitchin write about it, but I picked up this ancient map that shows where it is. And, it, and, and um, uh, this was on uh, Coast to Coast recently. Uh, David Sarita talked about it and how it's um, invisible. It's hard to see because it's black, but that doesn't mean it's not there. And here we have all these spaceships that just keep showing up. Ah, so the MUFON chief, investigator David Toon, he did research on this and he called them techno signatures. And um, I just uh, clipped this from, as a sampling of, he has hundreds of photos, he was sharing it um, on the United MUFON channel last year. So you can go look that up and see his work. But he says, they are not comets, they're not asteroids, they're intelligence. So I have the video of this captured, um, so, this, this was just astounding, okay? So all of the top, those are all um, space telescopes, and the bottom are pictures from the ISS, and here's the video. This was hanging out over the Earth for two months in 21, May and June. Is that coming? Yeah, it gets a little clearer. It's blurry and then it goes clear. And you can see these little scout ships coming and going in it. In fact, that bottom piece is a ship that is going into it. There's the aurora over the earth, so you can see the scale of how big this thing was, but it was way up into the upper ionosphere, way above, so that's probably why people couldn't see it from the Earth, but they saw it from the ISS. And you know, the ISS is home to 11 space agencies. Um, it's not all run by NASA. And this video was taken by one of the Spanish astronauts from the ESA, the European Space Agency. So they don't all follow the same rules. So at, there, you, there you see all the different little scout ships around it and that little bottom piece just disappeared because it went in. A lot of coming and going and it hung out there for two months. So people thought it's an Anunnaki ship. Oh, it looks like the Klingon warship, you know, because this is why we have science fiction. So people have something to relate to. And everybody, once that video was out, the genie's out of the bottle, everybody put it on their YouTube channel, so it's out there. And you can see the movement. You see the lights changing because there's ships coming and going. There's stuff happening in there. I was pretty gobsmacked when I saw this first. I was like, whoa. 
And because I, you know, there was so many other people talking about it, so like it's it's for, it's it's for real. He 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 um, he videotaped this on his cell phone. That's why it's a little blurry because it's not official. Like, you know, and this is the human piece of astronauts. Like, they want people to know what they saw. And a lot of them are under NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. But this, this guy's from the ESA, so he doesn't have to cater to NASA. So I'm getting to the end here. We can go for a break soon. Um, but we're seeing all this stuff. And this is money. This is um, the uh, Swiss one of the Swiss bills, and they have the, the whole system on there. See, the truth is hiding in plain sight. So I guess we can go for a break now. Yes, we're all good. had some questions. I hope to get them answered, some of you, um, that, are, that is in here. I'm just going to go through some of these photos to finish up that first phase. You can see that the warming that we're experiencing is real. It's not some propaganda thing, you know, because everybody was like in denial because of what the, you know, the globalists have tried to do with it, you know, to guilt trip humans and say, oh, it's your fault because of the light bulbs that you use or, you know, your cows fart too much. And <laughs> it's, it's not your fault. And it's not about the cows. Um, it's about the sun. And you really have no control over the sun. So this is, the warming is real, though, and the real cause of climate change. And so what's happened is that each time we get these solar flares, they basically wave into our magnetosphere, and they cause the Earth to warm up. So that's what's happening. Um, and this was from last year, um, the geomagnetic, thank you so much, Shane. The geomagnetic field uh, has just been going off the charts. And last year, there were three cracks to the magnetosphere, three. So that means, that's very significant, that means that when solar flares come through, coronal mass ejections wave over the Earth, it's seeping in. Our magnetosphere is our protective bubble. And this is the reason for not only the warming, but the, uh, uh, they call them SARS, stable aurora reds. Okay, so we're also seeing auroras. You can't call them northern lights anymore because they're coming south. So we're seeing auroras in Colorado, okay? Um, and even Texas, we've had photos of auroras in Texas. And that's because the magnetosphere is cracked. And the Earth is shifting. So there's a confluence of things going on. And the colors in the sky is part of the end time prophecies that's, uh, that, that even the Hopis were told about. Watch the skies. And you know, it's a confluence of things that you, you have chemtrails. They're chemtrailing the skies like crazy every day. So you have oil up in the upper atmosphere. And it creates prism effects when the sunlight hits it. So you get all these crazy clouds and 
you know, rainbows going in opposite directions, and, and of course the aurora is all over the place. So what happens is that it causes the Earth to, to heat up. We have what's called the Schumann uh, frequency, Schumann resonance, which has to do with the Earth's natural hum, which is 7.83 hertz. But each time these solar flares and coronal mass ejections wave over the Earth, the Earth reacts to it, and we see spikes in the Schumann resonance. And this happens almost daily, though sometimes we get a lull, and there's like, oh, OK, we got a little break from that. But these are common symptoms, OK? Uh, dehydration, even. Even if, like, you know, I live in a dry climate. You guys live in a dry climate, so you know you live with that. You have to drink a lot of water, right? But there's more than just that. There's people can't sleep, they get headaches, they get body aches, they get nausea, they get anxiety. I mean, off the charts, kind of like, you know, unexplainable, you know? So this is what's going on. Myself and a bunch of others online, you know, we sort of comfort each other every day with, oh, OK, is that why I'm feeling this way? OK, so there's a reason for it. And you know, it's also called spiritual fatigue. Um, but this all, you know, it's, it's scientific that, and it's not just us, it's the animals too. The animals feel it. And we're seeing all kinds of unusual animal behavior where, you know, whales are beaching themselves and uh, there's aggression uh, that we've never seen before, like in, in the killer whales, or they're just going after human boats. Okay, so what's up with that? So back to the truth is stranger than fiction. So I know I grew up in the 60s. A lot of you have. A lot of baby boomers here. So um, you remember growing up with the Jetsons. Well, you know, this is our reality now. Um, the Marvel Universe, there is a lot of truth happening through those scripts. So um, who here has watched the Loki series? Yeah, OK, epic ending, right? The finale, wasn't that epic? So he was, and this is something that has never happened before in the Marvel Universe, so Loki was known as the god of mischief. Well, what do you know? Enkai was known as the god of mischief, okay? But Loki has this whole character development where he doesn't feel really like confident in being a god or a king, and he goes through all of this whole drama, and he finds his, his godhood. And now the Marvel Universe has now changed his title from God of Mischief to God of Stories because he saved the timeline. Okay, so the whole entire series is about time travel. So if, if you haven't seen it, it's on the Disney, you can binge watch it. It's, you gotta watch it from the beginning. You can't just, you got, it's one of those, you know, it's very intense. And then we have Marduk. You know, Sitchin talked a lot about Marduk. He was, you know, the lord, he was a lord of everything, a lord of Babylon, the lord of Nibiru, the lord of Mars. You know, that's where we get the word Mars from. It came from Marduk. But, you know, when I saw this uh, ancient statue of him and then I looked, gee, he reminds me of somebody. Thanos, look, look at the cuff. Look, I mean, it, it, and, I, and I don't know if the writers uh, used him as an inspiration or if it was just truth is stranger than fiction. So in Norse mythology, you know, uh, Loki was known as the god of mischief and, and Enkai the god of wisdom and, and the god of water. And again, remember that they're merely titles. Enkai is a title, so there have been multiple gods of the water, okay? And here's me connecting dots to a bunch of them. So you've got Dagon, the fish god of Egypt, Oannes, um, uh, Neptune, um, the Vishnu, uh, Matsa, Matsa Vishnu, which you know she came came out of the water, and then you have, of course, the Church of Rome, that is the Church of Babylon. They have been practicing the Babylonian religion since day one. They never stopped. They just switched out the gods. 
So they, all of their garb and their traditions and their costumes are all fashioned after this fish god, the Mitar. So isn't that interesting? And we have Aquaman. Okay, so you know, Aquaman 2 is starting in December 20th. I'm very excited. So <laughs> um, this was what got me down these rabbit holes in uh, 19... Uh, 95 was the year I kind of woke up. I was living on Indian Rocks Beach, and I used to go and watch the sunset every night. And after the sunset, one night in April, I uh, heard rumbling coming out of the ocean, and I thought, well, it could be a pod of dolphins, which is very common. They come close to shore, and it wasn't. And I thought, I can't. And then I saw something emerge, and I thought, oh my God, it can't be a submarine it's so close to the shore. And it was. A, a, a silver disc-shaped ship, which looked very similar to this. Obviously, I didn't have a, a camera. I didn't take a picture. But I watched it come out of the ocean. I, I heard the swishing sounds of the foam and, and all of the water coming off it. And I was literally like gobsmacked, like my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And it just, it hovered for about a minute, like as if to get clear of the water. And then it just shot up into the sky, like in like 30 seconds, like a New York minute. It was just gone. And I watched it go into the, so the sky. All the stars were out. There weren't any clouds that day. It was a balmy evening. And it like became a star. It, like, it looked like it opened up a portal and just disappeared. And that was it. So that's when I learned about MUFON. So my, I told my friend about, about it. And he was a member of MUFON in Florida. And he told me that MUFON got like 350 calls that night from other people along the beach who saw the same craft. So I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone when I saw it either. You know, I was hanging with my neighbors. And I, 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 it just like, it did a number. I mean, I, I mean, seeing is believing. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? So that's how I got started down these rabbit holes <laughs> and of uh, UFOs and USOs. And uh, thank you for buying my books. You, you have this information now. It's in there and where it is in the Bible. So there's nothing new under the sun. This has been going on on this planet for millennia, OK? Who it was, where it came from, I don't know. But they've been around for a long time because they've been recorded. So they're in the Bible. Okay, so the Tampa Triangle, which is where I was, um, seems to be a hot spot. So I have a theory about the planet is, uh, has all these portals all over the place. And the Gulf of Mexico is definitely one of them. And then these two Tic Tac UFO ships were photographed and seen over the Gulf. Um, not too long after, you know, I, I was there in that picture. I just went to go visit. And then that happened. So I thought, hmm. So it's a, it's a whole thing going on. These photos are uh, released, declassified from the Navy. And they were taken in the Arctic Sea in 1971. OK, so they have a lot of these, the Tic Tac, the famous Tic Tac, that pretty much started the whole disclosure era. And then, you know, back then when I was searching what was going on, I used to stay up all night. Uh, I had terrible insomnia. I just gave into it. And I used to sit on my balcony and watch the sky change from dark to dawn. And one night, I saw the sky look like this, OK? And I drew it. This is my drawing, OK, from 1995. And it, it was like, and it happened very briefly. It was like, like a glimpse of the fact that there was this honeycomb-shaped something over the sky. And now I'm like, whoa, I am seeing this in like every Marvel movie. They are just showing this all the time. If anyone has seen Captain Marvel or the Marvels or uh, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, they're all showing this. So there's another truth is stranger than fiction piece. So I am convinced that the planet is full of portals. 
Okay, and this is why uh, UFO activity seems to show up in certain areas over and over and over again. Uh, these are uh, the rest of those photos that were declassified um, from the Arctic Circle that were all taken by the US Navy. So they've known about this for a very long time. So remember this news last um, March about the latest mothership? Now we can use that word, okay? You, you, you can't be laughed at by talking about a mothership. The, the Pentagon talked about it. So, you know, this is all part of our validation and disclosure. Okay, so as I was saying earlier, so what, what they've done is that, and I have this in the book five, The Heavens, it was uh, the sun solar simulator were patented in 1961. It's our year we were born. And, <laughs> and you, you wonder, why did they patent a solar simulator in 1961? But there were several patents all through the early 60s, and it all came together very recently. So I think in about 20, 11, this was put up there, and that's why people get all these crazy pictures of the sky. Like, what the heck is going on there? Reflections, refractions, prism effects, because there's mirrors in, in space. And what do mirrors do? What does light do? Well, light obfuscates, light reflects, light you know, can, can re re refract, and, and illuminate. So it really depends on how the light, the angle, is showing up. And sometimes, and this is not a perfect system, okay, so the technology is slightly flawed, okay, so they're, they're attempting to cover things up, but they put it up there to retard the warming. And this was a decision that was made in the 80s when I was telling you about the trio with uh, Reagan and Thatcher and Gorbachev, how they can retard the warming, so they started putting all this stuff up in space. But it doesn't only retard the war warming because that's sort of like going up the hill with the wind in your face. <laughs> Good luck with that, because it's, it, it's happening from the sun. So, but what it does is it seems to work to cover things up in the sky. But every now and then, like I said, it can light illuminates. So if you get it at a certain angle, that light can show um, what's, what's happening around the sun. And we are seeing the sun illuminate some of the planets from the Earth, not just through the space telescopes. And these pictures down here are all taken from the Earth. Okay, so we've got all kinds of pretty shapes and, you know, and then all the mirrors. There's tons of mirrors up there. And if you play with mirrors and lights and prisms, you get a whole lot of different anomalies. Okay, so this is where I wanted to be before, but here we are. So the fallen angel story, okay, was the Anunnaki. Okay, so they came, they raped the earth women, so here's where I distinguish myself from Sitchin. So Sitchin said the Anunnaki created humankind. My assertion, based on the history, okay, the ancient history, is that's, that, that they couldn't have created humankind because the woman, human, was already on the earth when they came. So somebody else had to create the women. What they did do, and what he was right about, was the genetic manipulation. So they genetically manipulated humankind. And in my opinion, based on the uh, ancient books of Adam and Eve, and even some of the scriptures in the book of Genesis, that, that the Evademic race, which is us, Adam and Eve, were created with everything. It said that, that they walked with God. They had it all. They, had their, they walked in their glory bodies, okay? They had it all. They were like superhuman, okay? And then the serpent came and tried to, uh, and raped Eve and seduced her and did all kinds of stuff because they didn't want humans to have uh, control of the earth. Okay, and that's when all this cosmic drama started to happen. Okay, so 
I'll give it to you in a nutshell. So we went from, we went from uh, 12 strands of DNA to two. So when the geneticists will look at our DNA and they'll say, mm, it's junk DNA, because they don't know what it is, because it's been disabled. But the promises of God is that in the end, he comes to restore all things. And he restores human creation back to its original glory body, which was all 12 strands operating, which is kind of like the superhuman. They didn't want humans to have all those powers. So they genetically downgraded humans to two strands of DNA so that they had enough intelligence, and this is what Sitchin you know, wrote about as well, enough intelligence to follow orders and to essentially be servants of the Anunnaki. So the story is that the Gigi were their servants, and then there was like a mutiny, and they rebelled, so they had to replace the Gigi. And the Gigi are said to be like some kind of mm, hybrid between greys and something else. And so that's, that's how we got involved. And they genetic. So if you read the beginning of Genesis and the whole beginning of the Bible, everybody lived to be like 900. Methuselah lived to be like 960. Then the Noah's flood happened, and then people didn't live to be past, what, 80, 90, 100, 120 if you're lucky. So something, there was a genetic manipulation just even on the age, but more than that. So now I'm going to bounce to this, OK? So you guys know here in Tucson, uh, Arizona, you have on Mount Graham the Lucifer telescope, one of the Lucifer telescopes. There's two. And they're two of the most sophisticated Earth-based telescopes. And it's uh, obviously uh, an abbreviation for large binocular telescope, infrared utility with camera, and integral field unit for extragalactic research. That's a lot for the Vatican and the Church of Rome to be in charge of, and they are. And this is another piece of disclosure that blew my mind, okay, when I stumbled upon it, was that they want to control the disclosure narrative, okay? Well, out of all entities on the earth, past, present, and I never would have thought it would have been the Catholic Church. Okay, but I call them the Church of Rome because Catholicism came in 1000 AD. So it all started back in the Church of Rome, which was the, the, the religion of Babylon. And that's why in the Bible, in the uh, book of Revelation, in the end time prophecies, they talk about mystery Babylon, okay, which is the Vatican. A lot of people think it's America. No, it's the Vatican because they're still practicing the ancient Babylonian religion. And they have 50, I heard recently, 53 miles of ancient documents hidden underground. Okay, so it's almost like um, the libraries of Alexandria in the past, you know? So it's like, why are they sitting on all this knowledge? They could, that people could, you know, I mean, just think of all the, uh, mental disorders that people get from religion that, that, that they could be healed of just from knowledge. Knowledge cures, knowledge empowers. Why are they holding all this from the public? Okay, so um, as I was telling Stacy, and um, we were talking uh, on the way here, about the first and second books of Adam and Eve, which is all about the relationship, okay, between the Lord, the humans, the angels, and the serpent, who we call Satan. And they deleted that out of the Bible. So in the Bible, you only have a brief synopsis of that whole story. One little piece, okay, about an apple and a tree and Eve and deceive, and let's blame the woman, okay, because phew, that's a whole thing, all right? So <laughs> don't get me started there. So. Um, so the, these are ancient Jewish texts, which are called Apocrypha now. And you can get them. You can order them online. All these books I quote and reference in my books. That's why I have it here. Um, so you, know, you can look things up for yourself. I encourage everybody to do so. So here we have in the Vatican this object that was uh, created by this Italian sculptor, Arnaldo Pomodoro. And don't you think it looks just like the object that I was showing you earlier that we found in, in the Soho, in the coronagraph, and a little like the Death Star? 
And then you've got the uh, pine cones all over the place. Okay, and they're very big. This is ancient uh, Anunnaki Babylonian religious symbolism. And I know that looks busy, but uh, it's just to show the whole collage of all, like it's not all the artwork, but it's like a lot of artwork that was done that shows UFOs in it. And you know, uh, it, it was interesting that 2009, they, it was declared the year of astronomy by the United Nations. And that's when the Vatican basically came out with all their UFO research. They want to control the narrative. It's like, anyone here not see the movie Contact? Remember, remember the movie Contact? Remember what that whole competition was about? Who's going to be the human to represent Earth? And, and all that they had to go through, they wanted the science, and they wanted someone who believed in God, and you couldn't have some, you know, and that was that whole drama, okay? Well, the Vatican wants to be that person. They want to be the point of contact. And what they're doing in their research is they've hired these uh, two Jesuit priests, okay, to uh, control these Lucifer telescopes, and what are they doing? What are they tracking on the Lucifer telescopes? They're tracking Nibiru, and they're tracking alien ships. OK, they want to be the first ones to say, hmm, they're here with us. Now you need to follow what we tell you to do. And it's no coincidence that the Bible prophecy talks about this false prophet, the whore of Babylon, the that sits on seven hills, which is Rome. So biblical speak, the woman is always the church. So you're either the virgin, the bride, or you're the whore. Okay, the whore is the false church. And that's how the scripture is worded. Okay, so I unpack this in my book so you could see the words, and it is the Vatican, today's Vatican. The Church of Rome sits on seven hills. Rome sits on seven hills. So somehow they come up with, and, and you know, this last pope, he has moved the peg several moves forward in this prophecy. He has, cre you know, the, the prophecy of, uh, is about a one world religion, a one world government, and one world currency. Well, you know, in my little mind here, I could see how they can create the one world government because they've been trying to do that for the longest time, the new world order. I can also see how they can create a one world currency. They've been trying to do that, flatten, every, you know, just to kind of flatten the playing field. But a one world religion, ugh, honestly, I couldn't get, get my head around it. People in the same religion don't even agree with each other, okay? <laughs> You know, you, there's that old saying, Rodney Dangerfield, you put two Jews in a room, you get 10 opinions, you know? And I mean, how, how could they possibly come, a, come out with a one world religion? But this is what the prophecy says, and it comes through some alien savior, okay, who our Bible calls the Antichrist, that the Church of Rome props up. And why do they prop him up? Because they discuss, he comes through them. And the prophecy talks about the revived Roman Empire. Okay, well, if you look at the, Ro at the map of the Roman Empire, oh, this is, uh, I'll let you look at this while I, while I talk. This, yeah, this is uh, some gigantic spherical object courting into the sun like fueling, like a fueling station. Now, David Toon, he uh, talked about this, and he said, that's not a, a coronal mass ejection. That's not uh, a solar flare. That's something that creates this sort of tornadic activity to suck plasma out of the sun. So something's going on there. And, and this was the, uh, that big solar eclipse of 2017. And this video was taken in Turkey. So uh, what you see, uh, sorry, it's a little wobbly, but um, what you see on the right side of the screen is our actual sun being eclipsed by our actual moon. What's on the left is not. 
So there's all kinds of hypotheses about, well, what was that? That could have been the solar simulator separating from the sun because it's kind of off track a bit. It could be the second sun. It could be nem nemesis. It could be a bit of both. I don't know. And then we see these wheels also passing in front of the sun. Well, it, it, it reminds us of the Bible story, Ezekiel's wheel. Okay, and in fact, it's called Ezekiel's wheel for that very reason. And here it is. And that was passing through the sun. In 2020, 2020 was a big year. A lot of stuff happened in 2020. Why do you think they shut us all down? Just saying. These are just illustrations um, because, you know, they talk about these living spaceships in the Bible. And this is like, um, you know, in the movie Contact, that spaceship that they used was actually made for Terminator 2, but they never used it. So they used it in, that's just a little movie trivia there. So yeah, you know, there's so much going on and people say, where is this in the Bible? It's all over. In fact, the whole book of Ezekiel is, is all about physics and spaceships and, you know, like I was telling you earlier, Elijah, you know, he was another one, a frequent flyer up and down, Enoch, another frequent flyer. So this is nothing new. Okay, so now we're back to Chaim Eshed. So, you know, uh, Jerusalem, what is it with Jerusalem? It's the only place on the planet, on planet Earth, that has been owned and taken over and controlled by almost every empire, multiple civilizations, multiple players. Okay, you, 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 you can't say that about all these other countries. Something's going on there. And this is uh, Sitchin uh, talked about from the ancient Sumerian that there was an ancient spaceport that the temples really were spaceports. So um, just the fact that there was a spaceport means that there was a space portal, okay? So it's my opinion that Jerusalem is an ancient space portal. And that space portal belongs and is owned by the God of Israel, okay? So um, I, I got to work with uh, the uh, late uh, ufologist, Israeli ufologist, Barry Hamish, and he uh, gathered uh, uh, quite a bit of eyewitness uh, um, reports about uh, these UFOs, the burns on the Shikmona Beach. And I looked it up, Shikmona Beach is, is right outside of Elijah's cave. So remember Elijah, frequent flyer, he comes and goes, okay? So there's a portal there, okay? And, and this is like from ancient times into, you know, modern times. This is 1987, 1988, up to 1992, they were having UFO sightings on Shikmona Beach. And then, as if that doesn't get enough, you know, weird, then the, the people in the town were report, and all this is in my book, the whole entire report, but um, they, were, they were reporting giants. They were seeing giants, and, and then they would disappear. So there's some kind of portal there that they would come and go. So I'm gonna talk about giants now, because this is a piece of what is happening. Um, you know, the giants lived on the earth. The Bible talks about it. Um, this is this scripture in Exodus 12.12 12 about the God of gods, the father of all the gods, brings judgment on the lower gods. So that's how you know who you're dealing with in the spiritual hierarchy. And let's face it, one of the major battles that has been going on through our known history has been between monotheism and polytheism, you know, paganism. So um, in ancient Egypt, they, they inserted Akhenaten, and his job was to insert monotheism, the idea of it, into the Akashic record of the earth. And they knew, and he apparently came from Sirius, uh, he was kind of alien looking with the big 
long head and the bulby stomach, and he was tall and kind of lanky and goofy looking, but, but he was all about worshiping one god, okay? And the Egyptians were not having it, okay? And I'm sure you guys know the story. And then, you know, after they killed him and all of that, they went back to paganism and polytheism. Then came Moses. So uh, the God, you know, used Moses to continue this idea of monotheism. Okay, so we, and even to this day, you know, Christians fight against each other because, oh, they think this is pagan and Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, all this stuff because they know that they have to, and you know, that Israel and the Israelites got punished for uh, following after these pagan gods. So this is a very big part of this cosmic drama. Like, like it's like that old show, like will the real Messiah stand up? You know, and that's what everyone is going to learn in the end, who that is. So, you know, this is all about this progeny of rebellion, okay? And these giants, not only have they returned to ancient Israel, but they are being seen in different parts of the planet. So it's not just the portals coming out of Israel. And it's my opinion that they live inside the earth. And they've also, oh, this is just to show you that giantism is a thing. I mean, these are photos that have been taken, you know, from like 100 years ago, and this one was pretty recent, and some people have this DNA, where they just like are really, really tall. But we were, Stacy and I were talking, it was like, well, how tall is tall? Like the Anunnaki, they were like 35 feet tall. And then came the Nephilim, and they were between like 9 and 15 feet. So, you know, and these days when you see somebody seven feet tall, you go, oh my God, he's a giant. So this is all ancient DNA getting flushed out. And, you know, again, written in stone, you, you can see the depiction between humans and giants and how they lived. But what was the problem? The problem was that these beings, it, it says, they sinned against humans and animals, and they did horrible, cruel, unthinkable things. And God just couldn't look upon it, couldn't ha he had to stand up for something, and so he flooded the earth. But the floods happened more than once, because the Bible starts off, Genesis 1-1, and the spirit hovered over the waters of the earth. That picks up after the first flood. So that is what we call Lucifer's flood, which was the floods of the civilizations of Atlantis and Lemuria. And guess what? As I was saying earlier about how we're coming to the end of this processional age of Pisces, and what happens when we get to the end of the age of Pisces, we go into the age of Aquarius, and the la and ages last 2,160 years. So that makes, and all the ages go backwards, right? So we go, we count down. Right now, the sun rises at the vernal equinox of um, three degrees of Pisces. So, so there's 30 degrees, and we count 0 to 29, not 1 to 30. So 0 is that transition point. So we count down 3, 2, 1, 0. So we are almost there at the end of this age. And all the promises of God are at the end of the age. At the end of the age, all this conflict happens. And then you know, the Messiah returns and sets up heaven on earth at the end of the age. Okay, So th this is, we're coming close to that. So, so guess what? Okay, so, so 2,160 years times 12 is like uh, 24, 26,000 years approximately, give or take, right? And the last time we had an age of Aquarius was during the times of Atlantis. So that whole period of history is coming full circle. And there is no coincidence that the movies, Aquaman, take place under the water, under the earth, in what they call ancient Atlantis. Just saying. So what this was here I, uh, was these are giant uh, ancient technologies. Okay, and this is another piece of like, I've heard this through the grapevine without attaching names to it, that the, our government knows about all this ancient 
giant technology that is not only here on Earth, but on the moon and on Mars. And it's just giant. So the giant stuff was for the giants. Okay, all of this you can see is, is you know, the ancient tech, it was just gigantic. So Jerusalem, this ancient space portal that all of these civilizations have tried to own. So Babylon, let's just give you a little history. Babylon took Jerusalem 2,600 years ago. Persia took it 2,500 years ago. Greece took it 2,200 years ago. Rome took it 2,100 years ago. Then the Muslims took it 1,300 years ago. Then the Ottoman Turks took it 500 years ago. Then the British took it 100 years ago. And then just over 50 years ago, to date, Israel took Jerusalem back in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, which was 50 years to the day of October 7th, uh, what they're calling a mini Holocaust by Hamas, which is a proxy of Iran, who is ancient Persia. So the who's who of the end time war is all listed very in very great detail in Ezekiel, Psalm 83, Psalm 83 already happened. That was uh, the Yom Kippur War, okay, with Egypt and Syria and Jordan, and now they've made peace treaties, which is why Egypt and, Syria and, and Jordan really don't want anything to do with Hamas. They don't want the Palestinians, they don't want, they don't want it. That was the whole uh, agreement, was like, okay, to the Israelis, you deal with them, okay? so. Um, the, the ancient Palestinians comes from the word Philistine. So the, the ancient Philistines, sorry, the ancient Philistines were this arch enemy of the ancient Israelites. And when Rome was ruling over Israel, they used that word Philistia, and then it got watered down through language, which became Palestine, and called it Palestine just to stick it and humiliate the Jews. And that's where the word came from. However, it was called Israel before that, because remember in the book of Genesis, you know, uh, it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob became Israel. And the land was given to Jacob and his sons. Okay, so here we have the same thing happening, except just in a different century that happened during World War II. World War II and World War III are connected. And that little picture in the middle there is the Mufti sitting with Hitler because they both had something in common. They hated the Jews. They wanted to get rid of them. They wanted to genocide them. So, you know, who owns Israel? The God of Israel owns Israel, okay? It's not owned by people. It's given to people to steward. But the God of Israel owns Israel, and the God of Israel is going to return in exactly the same place that he left, that portal in Jerusalem. So, you know, they've been fighting over the land, but here you can see that the 12 tribes of Israel were given the land, and then, of course, after the, they, you know, there was like rebellion and sin and all those stories and all that, and they went off into the diaspora, and they ended up all over the planet. So in my uh, fourth book, Covenants, I have like where everybody ended up and how, um, how that's relevant to also the end times because people are eventually, the, the, the role of the Messiah, the unique role of the Messiah is to bring everyone together, okay? And, and you know, we as human beings, we are very powerful when we're united. Okay, so this is one of my uh, uh, new chapters in uh, book one, is the Machiavellian alien agenda, and Machiavellian is a policy to divide and conquer, because if you're divided, then you're, you can't have that power, and you're weak. So what was happening in Israel right before the October 7th attack, Israel was more divided than they'd ever been before. Everyone was fighting right and left, the secular versus religious, and it wasn't even like a recognizable, and now everybody's uh, united again. But that's how the enemy came in, because they were weak, because they were divided. So, you know, this really 
has happened. And I know, you know, back in World War II, there was a lot of denial about the Holocaust, and people saw pit, they just couldn't believe that this was happening. But yet, all this stuff not only happened already, happened before, it happened in ancient times. So what they're dealing with now is this ancient spirit, okay, that has emerged out of the earth, that did the same heinous, disgusting things back then that they're doing now. So, you know, this is just to show, you know, uh, about the 12 tribes, and it was given to the land of Israel. The Palestinians were the Philistines, okay? But also, you have, oh, here's Sitchin. Sitchin's last lecture that he ever did was Why Jerusalem? So that's what inspired me to start my first book with the, first cha the, with the chapter, Why Jerusalem? And, it's be and then all of this came later. This is all recent. Y this year, they have now discovered that there is an ancient portal under Jerusalem. And in my fourth book, Covenants, I go on about the um, Ark of the Covenant that was found. There were two. And one of them is believed to be underground in Jerusalem, so much so that it was right under the place of Golgotha, and they believed that the blood of Christ fell on it, OK? And uh, one of the Israeli archaeologists went and actually scraped it and did a DNA. This is all in, uh, in my fourth book, Kav, you can read about this, and that that DNA was not human, just saying. So these photos are from Hubble. You know, before we had the JWST, there was Hubble. And Hubble took this picture. This was like back in the early 90s. So I put it on my book covers because it looks like the heavenly city, which they call the New Jerusalem, which is what Revelations 21 is all about, which to me is a mothership, OK? I mean, just read it, you know? 12,000 furlongs length, breadth and height, 12 gates open up, you know, pure glass, sapphire floors, gold, you know, all the, the foundation is made with all these precious stones. I mean, it's a phantasmagorical mothership. A city is a mothership. So this is what's coming. So going back to this, the cast of characters, I know it's kind of wordy, but um, I'll, I'll let you look at it if you can read it. Um, so we've got the War of Gog and Magog. And I, you know, like Christians go on about, you know, Magog, you know, oh, they think it's, it's really the land, the ancient land of Turkey, Meshek, and Tubal. And then the word Rosh, a lot of people think it's Russia, but it really means head, meaning like a prince, meaning like, you know, like the word is used for the government, the governor, like Rosh Hamshalah is the prime minister. He's the head of the government. So Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year. So Rosh means head. And uh, Gog, there's no ancient uh, city or place that's Gog. I am asserting that Gog is a leader and may even be a giant, OK? It may be this ancient, ancient spirit who somehow uh, comes through this, this land, which we call today Turkey, and uh, uh, ancient Persia, which is Iran. And the Scythians and the barbarians that the scripture talks about all co come from that uh, southern um, Persia, but where the Roman Empire was afraid of them. That's how, how awful and evil and terrible they were. So the revived Roman Empire seems to be now, OK, all these countries that the ancient Roman Empire used to rule over are now all Muslims. They're all Muslim nations, every one of them, okay, including Turkey. Okay, so this happened in our lifetime because Turkey used to be secular. In fact, it was a great place to go on vacation. And now it's become uh, the place, the home of the Muslim Brotherhood, and Erdogan wants to be the leader of the Muslim Caliphate and lead the, the 10 nations. And so the Bible talks about 10 heads of the same dragon. And they all go against Israel. 
Okay, why? What is it that they got? They are obsessed with this place. Okay, and it's really, you know, they take it out on the people, they take it out on the Jews and the Christians too, because the Christians are grafted in to Israel, the covenants of Israel. Okay, everybody who's grafted in are, are going to, you know, be on the receiving end of this hatred, but the hatred is for the God that runs, that rules, that owns the space portals there, the land, the ancient land, above and below. And that's what they're going after, and that's the end time war. Those 10 horns are all these Muslim nations, and they're all in place now. Because once Turkey went over, then that became the 10th. And all of these names, the ancient names, they, some of them have changed, and some of them are still the same. So, you know, like uh, Lebanon is ancient Seraphath or Sarafand. Now we call it Lebanon. Sardis is Turkey. Um, you know, Edom is uh, Palestine and Jordan, the West Banks, and all of these areas. Timon is Yemen. Um, so all of this is coming together, uh, which basically is World War III. But here's the thing with World War III is that it's not the very end, it brings the end. So there's this, this being that, that comes, emerges out of World War III, and he is the only one that is able to make a peace treaty with the whole uh, Muslim caliphate, all of the enemies of Israel, and Israel. And he brings peace to Israel. So the, so the Jews in Israel celebrate him. And he gets the third temple built. And that's something that they're just like chomping at the bit to do. But they can't because of the Muslims. So that's going to happen. When that happens, then you can start counting down. OK, that begins that seven year tribulation period. Because the first three and a half years, they think everything's OK. They think they have peace and security. and then. The this being, which we call the Antichrist, demands worship in the temple, demands them to bow down and worship him. And that's when the Jews wake up and they go, wait a second, you're not the Messiah, you're the false Messiah, and all hell breaks loose. Okay, and then he goes after everybody, Jews, Christians, anyone that goes, that goes against him. And that's what the prophecy says. I mean, I can't make this stuff up. It's in the book of Daniel, it's in Ezekiel, it's in Revelation, and this is, you know, what is being formed right now. So, um, you know, people have gone on about this six-pointed star. I put this in here because I wanted you to see that it's not just Jewish. They adopted it to make it their symbol and their flag, but it's ancient symbols that all these ancient civilizations have used. It's not like some satanic symbol that, you know, anti-Semites will want to tell you, oh, it's the sign of Remfam or Satan or this or that. All these uh, ancient religions have used Used it. It's also sacred geometry, the six point. It also represents the Merkaba. Okay, so in the book of Ezekiel, they talk about the Merkaba, which are these spaceships, which are three dimensional six pointed stars that like kind of rotate. You've got the, the top triangle going one way, and then the bottom triangle going the other way, and then you're in the middle of it, and that's, you know, technology. So here's another piece of the end time prophecy about the four horsemen. Now, for years, we listened to all these Christian eschatologists talk about, oh, one is you know, the horse of death or the horse of famine. Uh, but I don't think there's any coincidence here that the colors of these four horses just happen to be the colors of every single Muslim flag, including ancient including uh, Persia, which is written, they lead this, and they lead through proxy, okay? So the, the, the scripture says that, that, ancient, that Persia is going to destroy uh, Mecca, which is Arabia, which is now we call Saudi Arabia because it's run by the Saudi family, but it's still Arabia. But Iran is now Iran. It used to be called Persia. And that is their flag now. They changed the flag when they went over, changed their name to Iran. So 
you know, it's not just about a war between the Sunnis and the Shias. They all kind of get together and go after Israel. And that's what the prophecy says. So then I thought, OK, well, what's going on with the 12 princes of Ishmael? Because this is, let's face it, you know, a dysfunctional family drama. OK, Abraham, you know, he had uh, two sons, one with Hagar, the maidservant, and one with his wife, Sarah, who was the miracle baby. And this is ancient enmity between these tribes. But God also said he was going to bless Ish Ishmael with, with many nations, and he has. OK, so you know, there's a lot of history in here. But there's also curses, there's ancient curses. So the legacy of Ishmael is a generational curse. It's the bastard curse, because he was never uh, born out of, uh, he was born out of wedlock. So according to the Bible, that's an ancient generational curse. And that's why it says that everyone is against him, and they can never really find their peace. But the peace comes through everyone accepting the Messiah. And what's happening now is that these um, Muslims that are locked into these, these areas, they're, they're seeing visions of Yeshua. They're having dreams of Yeshua. 200 of them just recently all left Islam, and now they're following Yeshua. OK? So God is working in, in this whole situation. So. Um, we talked about this earlier, about uh, Enlil. So what I had done in my second book is through linguistics, uh, traced him to into, uh, that he became Allah. Because the Muslims say, oh, Allah wasn't there before. And yeah, he was. He was just, the language got watered down. So Enlil became Ilya, Ilyat, and Allah. And I show you that whole thing in, in book two. So. You know, what's going on is that they have left us. So one of the, Somebody had asked a question about the Anunnaki and how could they be reptilian and human if they created us and all this. And this is a big uh, area of, of confusion because, first of all, there was a whole group of them. And remember, they were at odds. There, it's like a family drama over control. So yes, the reptilians that are nine feet tall, OK, seven, nine, OK, so uh, William Tompkins, who uh, viewed, and he's coming up soon, he saw these nine-foot-tall lizard men. OK, well, m mainly they're underground. They're in the moon, underground. But they have this relationship with these Earth-based reptilians, OK, that are based on these historical agreements. OK, so when they come back, that's their point of reference to harvest. So there's several harvests. I go into this, I get into the weeds here and the words, because words matter. And the scripture talks about the harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. So who are the angels? OK, well, you know, they're not just fluffy winged cheruby like beings. They're, they're extraterrestrials. But first, their first order is to, co is to collect the tares, which are weeds. OK? That happens first. And then the fruit gets harvested. So you read Matthew um, uh, uh, th uh, 13, thir 39 about the harvest. And this has to do with it, because they come back to harvest their own. Just saying. And what do they got? They got, well, I hope we get to this point. They got a lot of hybrids. OK, so there's nothing new under the sun. As I was saying, that um, ancient Atlantis went down because they went against the laws of creation. They were mixing uh, seeds that shouldn't have been mixed. They were creating miscreants and monsters and, and all kinds of stuff. So that's when they got flooded. But the city of Atlantis, and this is, again, things coming full circle, I believe was this uh, mothership. Okay, that was a, a city that that you know laid over the earth and all the other 
um, you know, neighborhoods and cities and towns were built around that on the earth. So when the the floods were ordered, the um, uh, the main uh, city was a mothership, closed itself up and took off, and everything else sunk. Okay, so that is what's probably going to return at the end of the age because it's like full cycle. So, you know, the Book of Enoch, the, the, the Bible, the Book of Jubilees, these are all, the, you know, they're, they're telling us the same story of cannibalism, barbarism, and total disrespect for both human and animal life. And everything gets destroyed. And that happened again right before the floods of Noah, okay, which was the second flood. Okay, and then that's when the Lord said, okay, I'm not gonna destroy the earth by water again. Next time it's gonna be by fire. So you guys better behave, <laughs> you know, it was that kind of a thing. And what are we seeing now? What they did then, they're doing now. It's all happening all over again, so. So this is an ancient spirit, Leviathan. He's written about in the book of Job. And he's a twisted serpent um, that lives inside the earth. And he's also known as Yahweh Yaldabaoth, which translates to Yahweh the little child in Hebrew. And he's also known as the Demiurge, who was the first Nephilim hybrid giant. He had the head of a lion, the body of a dragon, who is this ancient spirit that is featured in the book of Job, and only the God of Israel has power over it, okay? But he's a python spirit, so, so he, he uh, spits out his stuff on earth humans, and he works through narcissistic projection, he twists communication, he creates misunderstandings, you know, he calls evil good and good evil, he blames the victim to sidestep responsibility, you know, and this is pervasive in our culture and on media and also during wartime. So it's important to be aware and discern this spirit. So this, uh, these are just some references to some of the stuff I've talked about in these different books, the UFO in Israel, the Giants, it's all at chapter 14. And uh, those of you who got my books, thank you very much uh, for, for picking them up, but you can find all this. And the history of, of the deal that Hitler made with the inner earth reptilians to genocide the Jews. This really did happen. It's not fantasy, okay? And uh, there was exchanges. And this is what the Cold War was about because when the Allies got the spoils of war, that's why they ended up in Antarctica. So <laughs> there's something uh, about this, why uh, Hitler was so obsessed with Aryans. And by the way, the Aryan race, the present day Iranians believe they are the Aryans. Okay, that's their, they hold, they hold that. And which is why they're not Arab. They're, you know, a lot of them are, you know, light skinned, blue eyes. And we see blue eyes, black people in Africa. There's, you know, blue eyes going, you know, through the Roman Empire. So this was this ancient race of beings that Hitler was obsessed with. Okay, so they ended up in Antarctica. So this is another point of disclosure that we're, gonna, that we're keeping an eye on because they went there because nobody was there. It was a good place to hide. And we're seeing spaceships, you know, from Google Sky. I mean, there's all kinds of reports. I am showing you, like, tip of the iceberg. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, and, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. The X-File movie all took place in Antarctica. And a lot of us believe that it, it was based on some true evidence that they just weaved into um, entertainment. But Enoch talked about the fallen angels buried under this mountain that is in Antarctica. Okay, so people have been reporting that they are seeing these giants appear 
and disappear in Antarctica. So this, these are maps of the inner Earth. Someone was asking me about the flat Earth stuff, OK? So I got a big fat chapter in uh, book five um, debunking flat Earth uh, for multiple reasons. One, like I said at the beginning, I'm a big witness person. So if, if multiple people have witnessed multiple things and they all tell you the same story over and over again, in a court of law, that's considered legal evidence, OK? And FYI, just to shut flat earthers down, OK, if you need, to, if you need this, go ahead and use it. <laughs> we have 11 space agencies on this planet. Hundreds, maybe even thousands, of astronauts have been to space from 11, not just NASA, OK? And not a single one of them has returned to Earth and said, hey, by the way, the Earth is flat. Nobody, nobody has said that. So, and, and it doesn't say it in the Bible, despite these flat Earth and uh, end time Hebrew roots, anti-Semitic cults, because they're all anti-Semitic, because they think that the ancient uh, Jews believed the Earth was flat, not true. In fact, it says just the opposite in the Bible because, again, mistranslations, they, they don't understand how Hebrew is, you know, unpacked. It's a language of physics and a sphere is as physics as you can get. And the word chug means sphere, bowl. They even use the same word in modern Israel today, you know, for a bowl. Okay, a bowl is a sphere. OK, so that's what it says. The Earth is not flat. So where do they get all this stuff from? OK, the firmament, the flat Earth, and all this. It's the inside of the planet. OK, there is a plane inside the Earth. The Earth has a sun inside the Earth. There's an ocean inside the Also evidenced, if you need scripture, it's there in the Bible. OK, the scripture talks about the waters that were called from the deep inside the Earth and pulled up to create the flood, as well as the, the rains that fell. So everything flooded. It was like, oh, we weren't going to like miss this one. He did it all at once. Okay. So there's oceans inside the Earth, which is Levi where Leviathan hangs out. Okay. And there's a flat plane inside the Earth. And there's a sun inside the Earth. So a lot of this is conflating. They don't understand that this is in the hollow Earth. And so why did the CIA, which is create this PSYOP, psychological operation, to allow this heresy to go out there of flat Earth and then become an end time cult, which it, which it is? Because they want to cover up what's happening inside the Earth. Just like they let all these crazy conspiracy theories about the moon. And so everyone who's a flat earther is also a moon denier because they don't believe that you can actually get, they think that there's a dome. It's not, it's not a dome. It's, it's, a, it's a magnetic field. And there's portals. And that's how they go. Why do you think they send rockets up from Cape Canaveral? Because it's, just, it's the way the Earth is, is, is curved. And, and it's just this, like, Sweet spot, that's how they get up there, OK? They've gone up. They've gone, I, I've met the astronauts. They absolutely went to the moon. And I said to Fred Hayes, I said, why do you think that, that, that there's all these crazy conspiracy theories out there that people think you didn't go and it was some sort of you know, Stanley Kubrick film? And he said, because they can't believe that we succeeded. And we succeeded beyond what they expected. And Apollo 11. Uh, qualifies as that. Because what they were planning, they were surprised. And I know you guys know this because the 2017 MUFON Symposium was named the Secret Space Program. And you had William Tompkins there basically giving his testimony as a whistleblower who sat in the control room and saw the video feed that, no, that the public didn't see okay, from the moon. And he saw the spaceships that they, that's why Armstrong had to uh, redirect the, um, 
you know, the ship to, to land, not where it was supposed to. He had to do it manually. And what they saw was spaceships around the crater. And then he said he saw nine foot tall lizard men standing next to them. So there it is. That's his drawing. And, you know, thank God for the whistleblowers. Otherwise, we'd be like mushrooms, kept in the dark and, you know, fed what. So, and, and he, he was very important. His testimony is very important. And, uh, you know, what happened? And then he got to talk to MUFON, and one month later, he died on that solar eclipse. So God bless him. So that's his book, Selected by Extraterrestrials, if anyone wants to read it. And he basically testified to Solar Warden that there's, you know, the secret space program. And here we are, you know. So I, I think we only have five minutes left. I'm sorry I didn't get all the way into this, but I would uh, like to open up for questions, if anyone has. Question? Hi, thank you for shedding light on um, the observatory here in Arizona and the Catholic Church. I was always wondered why the Catholic Church would oversee an observatory in Arizona. <laughs> uh, but my question is, uh, you mentioned the Cherokee Nation and the 12, 12 tribes. I know it's part of Mormon beliefs. And could you just say something a little more about that? I'm part Cherokee. Well, um, it, 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 you know, it was oral tradition. This is the research I found that the Cherokees continued to keep this going because they were part of the um, diaspora, so to speak. The first, there were two diasporas. The first one, the more ancient one, when everybody like dispersed all around the world, it, it all started out with these 12 tribes. And they ended up here. And they continued to keep the tradition of praying to great spirit whose name was Yahuwah. And they were the only tribe that did that, okay? So this, is, this was a distinction, in my opinion, you know, to put in because I thought, well, that's just another dot to connect, proving that you know, everyone all around the planet has been dispersed and we're all gonna come back together because the end time prophecy is focused on these 12 tribes again. So, and Yahuwah, Yeshua, Yahushua, you know, they come all together through him. So I, I just thought that was an interesting piece that's really, any other questions? We have room for just one more question, so hands right here. Thanks for a great presentation and all your research. Thank what you very much. What are you doing much. to prepare for the future? That's a great question. Well, I would say get, get your heart and your soul and your life right with the creator, you know? I mean, he is the creator of your soul, you know? You, 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 you're not, you have, you, you're not, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. Right? So, so you don't live in your body. Your body lives in your soul. And your soul is this big egg shaped. I'm going to see if I could uh, show you this. Uh, I'm not sure how this all works. I'm going to just flip right through it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't get to all this. I'm so sorry. But I'm going to show you something. <sighs> so sorry. OK. OK. So I, I drew this, I'm no artist, okay? I'm a writer, not an artist, but <laughs> this is your soul. You have this big egg, you're an egg, and you have seven layers, and they know exactly how you're created. So they know how to manipulate us, okay? So when people talk about implants, yeah, there's physical implants, but it's the etheric ones that really do all the, all the damage, okay? So that's where they put them in. And this was what the Lord showed me when I woke up to get rid of these implants so that I could be free. And one of them looks like a cruciform, okay, which is the religious spirit. So the religious spirit is not of God. 
okay? The religious spirit, in fact, Jesus, Yeshua, he, he rebuked it. He, 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 he was killed because of it, okay? It, it is the enemy. It is the counterfeit, okay? So, so the religious spirit stops you from having a personal, intimate relationship with your creator. The religious spirit makes you think you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to, you know, to, to be righteous and to be self. And it's not about that. It's not about all your works. It's about your, your relationship and, and love and grace, which is kind of an um, intangible thing, but it's only something that the soul can feel. So they, what they, the aliens, the alien agenda, they stick all these things and they use, and as Stacy said, you know, they've used religion, which is kind of a genius way of controlling people, and they do it through implants. And, you know, there's not just religious implants, there's, you know, health issues, there's all kinds of stuff that end up in this soul body. So when you focus on your soul body and clearing that and connecting with your creator, you're, you know that when you step out of it, you know, like this physical body, like kind of stepping out of a car, you're going to step right into your, you know, reality and see your creator, because that's what happens after you die. Everybody sees him. Okay. Thank you, Ella. Thank you. Thank you very much.